Hey, this is Jason Scott Montoya, and welcome to another episode of the Share Life Podcast. Today, I'm here with Don. It's Don. Say hello. Hey, Jason. How you doing today? <laughs> doing well. Don Nieder is um, a uh, entrepreneur. We uh, met many years ago through the Gwinnett Chamber of Commerce, and done life together here and there, and and uh, and everywhere. And um, he's actually uh, the founder of another business. He's semi-retired, but he has a new business that he started a few years ago called Flowgevity. And he teaches the Wim Hof method as well as um, cold therapy and, um, and other, other uh, physical and mental um, health benef beneficial sure. type of systems. And, and you can explore, uh, share some of those. Anyway, the, the reason we're talking today is that Don um, is hiking the Appalachian Trail. And he's about a quarter of the way through it. So I wanted to talk with him as he takes this small break. Um, his daughter is about to have a child. And so he stepped off the trail to be there, um, but he's going to jump back on it. But I wanted to take this snapshot and go, Don, you know, tell us about your story and what you've learned. So before we do that, you know, give people a little bit of context. Like people have heard of the Appalachian Trail. Some people know about sure. hiking it. There's a movies made about it. But what, what is it? What, why is it a big deal? And then tell us, why did you decide to, to hike it? I wrote a, a long letter about why I wanted to hike it, because uh, I wanted to, you know, really understand myself. It's been kind of on my bucket list of things to do, but the Appalachian Trail is a footpath that goes from Georgia, Springer Mountain in Georgia, to Mount Katahdin in Maine, which is in the far northern it's three, three or four hour drive north of Bangor, Maine. So it's up in the upper parts of, mm. of Maine. In fact, it's, yeah. it's north of the U.S. Canadian border. That's to okay. the to the east of that. So it's, it's way up there. It's in a place called Baxter Park. Okay. It's two thousand one hundred ninety three point one miles long this year. It changes wow. each year because they they redo the trail from time to time because of bridges that go down or mm. you know maybe they gain people. some property rights that they had around it to a different direction. So. Okay. It doesn't change by much, but it changes a little bit every year. But little, almost 2,200 miles uh, this year. It's yeah. through 14 different states. Um, you can hike it northbound and start in Georgia and end up on Mount Katahdin in Maine, or you can wait and start in June and hike from southbound from Mount Katahdin down to Maine. Okay. Typically, most people, uh, I think the, the, the speed record, I think, assisted with someone had people helping them. It was about 42 days where they're like running, jogging the whole time. Yeah. Um, yeah. But for most people, five months is probably a, like you're going at a pretty decent pace. And six months is probably average okay. of time to complete the trail. Yeah. And so um, why is it a big deal? Like there's lots of hiking out there. What is it about this that's so compelling? Yeah. Well, there's there's three major long trails in the United States. The Appalachian Trail, which is the shortest of the three, uh, Pacific Crest Trail, and then the uh, uh, Continental Divide Trail. That, and those two trails go from the, the southern Mexican border up to the Canadian border. Mm -hmm. One on the west coast, one in the, starting in New Mexico up to the okay. center of the country. Yeah. But the Appalachian Trail is the grandfather, and it's also considered the hardest of the three trails, just because of the the, the amount of elevation gain it was just literally particularly in georgia and north carolina you're going just up and down not switchbacks mm -hmm. you're going up and down mm -hmm. and when you find when you hike the entire trail you've climbed the equivalent of mount everest 16 mm -hmm. times wow so it's and you know every day i would have anywhere from three to six thousand feet in elevation gain yeah of, uh, if I, now it's total just elevation gain and then up and down it, yeah. it accumulates right yeah. Um, so I think everybody I've met seems to have a different reason. There is no, you know, specific purpose to it in terms of, you know, as a applied to a group. Yeah. But, you know, in, individually, it's um, most of the people on the trail. By this is it's not applicable all 100 percent, but they're they're usually young, before they've started their careers. You know, either before or after college or they're my age after their careers and their hiking. Mm. There's very, there's not, I'm not gonna say very few, but there's, there's fewer, you know, mid thirties to mid fifties. They're, yeah. they're yeah. certainly there, but there's, there's, there's fewer of them. Yeah. Um, and again, that's just because of the time availability to hike the trail. Yeah. The, you know, for me, it's, it's just something that's, 
I've felt this connection with, with nature uh, for a long time, but I haven't really been able to experience it. Yeah. And I, I've really, besides, you know, the connecting with a more, I guess, base part of our, of our beings, of our, of our spirits, um, which I believe, you know, nature for me would, would help, help do it's, you know, personally, you know, my wife had asked me, why are you hiking the trail? And it's, you know, this it's hard to pinpoint a specific reason. I, yeah. I don't, I don't expect to change. I expect to maybe be different. Um, when I finish the trail, um, one of the things that I've, I, uh, assumed, you know, would, would probably happen because you meet <laughs> a huge range of people yeah. uh, when you're on the trail. And the, and the, I mean, I, I can say 100%, every single person I've interacted with in the trails has, has been awesome. Yeah. It's been positive. Uh, I'm sure there's some, some asses out there on the trail, if you will, that are just yeah. for whatever reason, they're not nice people. Um, you don't find a lot of those and I, I haven't found any. So everybody I've talked to, and, and many of those are people who in, in everyday life, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't communicate with just because mm-hmm. they looked different. All right. Yeah. And by that, I mean, um, and nothing against these and maybe it was too much detail, just, you know, I'm not a tattoo person. I mean, there's a lot of tattoos on the trail with sleeves and, uh, or a lot of piercings and, yeah, um, it's, you know what? They're just when you sit down and talk to them, there's all everybody's a cool person, right? And yeah. So you know, we we get wrapped up in the uh, uh, you know this other universe. I, I call the trail an alternate universe. Yeah. And, and it's a, it's an easy way for me to transition from one side to the other. Yeah. Um, I just like that 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 image of it and the um, in the universe I'm in right now and speaking yeah. to you and having technology and beds and, you yeah. know, I can walk to a tap and turn on running water and grab it whenever I want, you know, versus mm-hmm. having to find a stream somewhere and filter it and yeah, um, make sure you sleep with your filter in cold nights. Cause if it freezes, it's no good. And you don't yeah. know it's no good until you get, you know, some stomach sickness. So it, it, uh, when I'm, when I'm back in this universe, my, my mind, maybe just because I'm 67 and my, you know, my, my upbringing was uh, in a way that I, I, I wasn't always, um, I'm not sure how if I'm saying this right, but uh, even though I love all people, I'm open to everybody. I literally, I mean, I just, as you know, with me and the Wim Hof method, I want everybody to learn it. I want everybody to be happy. I want everybody to be healthy. Yeah. 100%, yeah. No exceptions. Um but still, we have our own, uh, you know, kind of mindset uh, about people and stereotypes, mm-hmm. and and people I wouldn't walk up to naturally in the past. Yeah, you know, yeah, that's totally changed because mm-hmm. just the people I've interacted with, it's you know, you, yeah. you can't judge a book by its cover. Is such mm-hmm. a true, true saying. Yeah. So, what what is it about the? I mean, you could have done, and and others could could do something other than the Appalachian trail. They could do a marathon or an Ironman. Like there's a lot of challenging things. So what is the difference between something like those versus the Appalachian trail? Well, in, in terms of, you know, as I, I talk about in my classes, it's always a challenge people to do something hard. Mm-hmm. All right. I mean, do something hard every day. All right. Yeah. Um, and then whether that's, communicating with somebody that you know, maybe you wouldn't have in the past, like I just described, yeah. or it's trying a new food that you don't like, you know, or mm-hmm. try it for the, whatever, uh, just do something difficult or hard or, or this challenging every day. And then on an annual basis, I tell everybody do something, you know, pick something for the year that you're going to learn that you're going to do this hard, that scares you, this difficult, takes a lot of time, whatever, yeah. learning a musical instrument, whatever, mm-hmm. a language, whatever it may be. And, so my challenge for this coming last year was to run a trail marathon up a mountain in North Carolina. Uh, yeah. Uh, and this year was to hike the Appalachian trail. So that was part of my reason was it was just, and it was a, a big challenge. It was something that if I accomplished this, yeah, because I, I do teach mindset and I've, mm-hmm. I'm hundred percent convinced that I will complete the trail. All right. Yeah. 
barring an injury yeah, uh, or, or something else that, you know, personally with my family that takes me off the trail. It, but if that happens, if I get an injury, I have to come home like I have right now for my daughter. I always know I can go back and complete the trail, right? Yeah. So they have to wait a year, you know, if, if I break a bone or something. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. I will, I will go back and complete it. But the, um, the, the, the doing something that's difficult and hard is such is so hard to do on the trail. I mean, I've learned it's even because it's, it's you know, uh, rinse, you know, wash, rinse, repeat every day. <laughs> yeah. You, you get up, you strike camp, you, you know, you get your pack loaded and you start walking. And then, and that's what I find that the people who, who have given up, I think for the, for the most of them, other than not counting injuries. Yeah. We, we can all, do something hard that day. We can all climb Blood Mountain or Trey Mountain, mm -hmm. both very difficult climbs, especially early in, in the hike and be exhausted at the end of the day. But you need the ability to set up camp, go to sleep, get up and do it again the next day mm -hmm. and the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day. And that's where we lose some people because they, they don't, they haven't learned to kind of train that subconscious voice that says, it's too hot. It's too cold. It's too steep. It's too hard. It's too wet. It's too windy. It's too hard to set up camp. It's, I don't like the whatever. It's too something. Yeah. And they let that yeah. little voice get going. Their subconscious instead of living in the present moment, right? They're they're living in the future or in the past, and takes them off the trail. That's yeah, the fastest way to, to lose it. Yeah, dive into that a little bit deeper, like this idea that we're resistant to the hard work and and how how a success and achievement is on the other side of that. Well, I mean, actually, that's a good tie back. I hadn't haven't really looked at it as 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 applying to work, but it's it's very true. It's true. Of whatever, whether you're a student and studying, and you have a hard course coming up in this next semester, or you're starting a new job, uh, whatever it may be, or a new marriage, or you have your first child coming. You know, all these hard things that happen to us in life, but those are all things that take time. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, my daughter's pregnant and that is the, you know, this isn't a, this isn't going to be hard <laughs> having the baby. This is going to be hard for the next 18 years. <laughs> yeah. All right. So <laughs> you gotta, you gotta be in it for the long run. Right. And you gotta have that type of mindset. Um, so I do think the you know, living in the present moment is a significant benefit to any situation that I, I, I just mentioned in terms of mentally looking at it in a healthy way looking yeah. at in a way that, that doesn't scare you to continue the next day. It doesn't, doesn't talk you into quitting or giving up or, or giving into it. Yeah. And so uh, that's why I, that's really one of my, I guess, early lessons in the trails that it kind of validated this, this approach I've been taking the, this mindset. Cause I, I knew that would be hard. I knew that would be, and I still have a lot more days on the trail, but but I, I was kind of, you know, prepared for that. And I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, there's, there's days when, you know, you're, you're, you let those, if you know, the thought will come into your mind, but if you sit there and, and let it grow and, and dwell on it, it's, it's going to take over. So it's just a matter of acknowledging that thought and yeah, you know, thank you very much and continue on with your hike and just know that tomorrow is going to be a different day. And I yeah. will say that I, for me personally, every single step I've taken on the Appalachian Trail, which I tried to figure it out, but it's somewhere around a million steps or, you know, maybe 1.2 million steps is different. Literally, it's, I mean, the, the terrain and the trail and the views and the, the weather, the people, you know, everything changes so quickly mm -hmm. because you're, you're going around bends and you go from this huge, vast view of, of mountains, you know, 30, 40 miles away. And then you, you go around a corner and all of a sudden you're in a, the side of a mountain where two other mountains are coming together. And it's a, this, not even a valley. It's just, it's yeah. this crevice mm -hmm. where all these, it's just, it, you go from this, you know, huge view to this incredible detailed view of, of, of trees and just steep going down. It's just, it's awesome. But it, you go from walking on rocks to walking on roots to walking in mud and walking on water and, and walking on nice smooth trail, which is very rare. Yeah. Um, so it's, it, it's, um, it's a constant, uh, 
change, if you will. Yeah. Let me, let me pause for just a second. I need to. All righty. So I guess, um, you know, what's interesting about just that, the difficult, the hard, the hard, difficult, I think um, it's particularly my generation. And, and maybe you could even add, add to this based on, you know, who you saw on the trail, but a lot of my generation, there is an aspect of our generation, the millennials that is willing to do hard things in a, in a short-term sense. Like, mm -hmm. like you said, like have the baby, but what about raising the baby or what, a, um, you know, doing the hard thing for a day, but then what about for 20 days? Um, and, and I think in a lot of ways that's, it's our, our, an Achilles heel, but I also think it's our, it's a, um, a pathway to our, um, to our uh, development. So I'll give you an example, like for myself, you know, we, I went to college, me and my wife, and we borrowed a lot of money and got student loans and we had to pay those student loans back. And we ended up paying about $155,000 over wow. about 10 years. And we did it. We, we knocked it out the hard thing and it wasn't easy. It was hard. And it wasn't something like, I wish I would have, you know, I wish I would have had debt to, so I could have learned the lesson, right? It was that I made choices that had those consequences and I had sort of to come full circle. I had to, to embrace that. And through that process, I learned the lessons I needed to learn um, that I didn't have when I made those choices, right? So now I don't have to make those bad choices again um, now that I paid for them. <laughs> right. And sometimes you learn lessons that, that wasn't your intent to learn that lesson, but you, exactly, you know, if yeah. you're aware, you learn it. So there's something about the hard, the difficulty that is is our pathway towards character development to become the person we want to become. So I'm curious, like, did you see any generational uh, elements? Um, is that just a human thing? Um, what did you see on the trail in terms of the people that fell off or the people that stuck through, stuck to it? Um, a lot of, I haven't seen personally, a, a lot of people, the, the, the people that have fallen out is just, as you, as you hike the trail and you, especially I've, I've been on and off the trail several times with so the people I'm hiking with have, have moved ahead of me. Yeah. And, um, like the guys I started with are about 250 miles down the trail yeah. from where I am right now, uh, just from the days I've taken off. So what I hear is mostly, you know, stories of mm. uh, what happened to so-and-so, you know, of course yeah. now we all, have, we all have trail names, <laughs> and, uh, which is, which really is, is a, it's a fun process to witness. And, uh, and is it given to you or do you name yourself? Uh, both the, uh, <laughs> the, the, um, giving it to yourself is becoming more common. The, yeah. you know, the, the, it's bad. It was bad form in the past to do that. Mm. And, and some people still consider it bad form. I, I don't think so. If, if it's something that's meaningful to you. Yeah. Uh, my trail name is longevity. Okay. Uh, and that really came from the third night on the trail. I was training four guys in the Wim Hof method. And the next day, guy named his trail name was Glacier. And the next day, we're hiking together. And Glacier says, "You know, I don't like, I don't give trail names, but I like talking it through with people, and you know, see what what comes out of it." So he just started asking me questions and talking. And he said, "Longevity." I said, "Yeah, I like that." So <laughs> you can you can accept a name, yeah. Or you know, if you get the name Farts a lot, then you might say, "No thanks, I don't want that." Uh, so you can you can decline a name or accept it. Um, so there's a lot of interesting stories just in trail names. But so I heard trail names of people who had had left the trail or quit the trail or, I mean, you know, one group of people it was it was, it was two couples, and one of the guys after like a week said, "I'm out of here. This isn't for me," and mm. just you know, and they were going to go all the way to Maine together. So it's you know, is, sure is that something where you know the guy was going along with her and it wasn't his own choice to hike the trail i don't know i don't know yeah. the detail I, I have a feeling it's, it's you know sitting around drinking beers and talking about hey that should be cool yeah i'll do yeah. that that's and a good idea there, and then yeah. doing it is like a Without, very different. yeah i mean i strongly strongly recommend anybody interested in hiking the trail one i love talking about it, so anybody can always reach out to me and i'll answer questions but do your research yeah. i've heard of so many people who started the trail um that 
didn't do the research and they discovered it was just a lot harder than they expected. Mm. Um, so they weren't so, ready for it. Yeah. So dive, dive into that tension, like the difference between um, what intentions and what we expect versus reality and the hard um, universe edges. <laughs> Well, like I said, I, I look at it as this, this, this alternate universe. So it, it kind of gives me this flexibility to be someone different, if you will. Uh, mm -hmm. Not that, that I'm someone different on the trail, but it's, um, you, know, uh, you know, one of the things that kind of draws everybody together on the trail is this shared experience. Mm -hmm. So when you're at mile 500, everybody else is like, they've also hiked those same exact mm -hmm. 500 miles. So it, it gives you this it, like immediate bond with, with somebody that you don't know because yeah. you got this, this, this awesome shared experience and I know how hard it was. So I know they did it too. So the mm -hmm. further you get along the trail, uh, the, you know, the, the, the less likely, uh, Um, anyway, you just cut out a little bit there. So tell us, tell us what you were saying. <laughs> oh, well, I would, I was just, um, uh, talking about the, uh, shared experience on the yeah. trail and that, you know, I'm, I'm trying to loop it back to your question and, and I'm, I guess I'm having a difficult time other than, cause you know, the people I meet on the trail, I'm meeting their, that their trail personality, if you will. Mm -hmm. And you don't always get a view of the outside world. Now, the, the times I've had a chance, a couple of people I've talked to who suffer from PTSD mm. and they would open up about some of their experience. There's a, uh, two guys that are hiking because they had um, violent deaths in their family in their, in their very mm. recent past and they're, they're, they're dealing with the emotions of that. So you don't see that, you know. Uh, uh, so it's hard to kind of, without having a deeper understanding of the, of the person, I guess, you know, maybe if you rephrase yeah. the question a little bit. Well, we could dive into a couple pieces. So I'll, I'll use another example um, or parallel. So you're also a, a famous movie actor. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> and uh, you'll be coming up in the new season of Stranger Things. So, you know, what's interesting about, because I've done that as well. And what's interesting about that, um, that seems to be an overlay here, is when you go on set, spe especially if it's a period piece, where you're, everyone's in a co you know different costume, or or the roles are you know are usually assigned, sure. uh, that are not stereotypical. Like everyone there is an equal. Like no, there are no cliques, there are no um, pre-established hierarchies. Everyone is there's an evenness um, uh, in in that area. So when you meet someone, the only thing you know about them is what they tell you, because right. even what they're wearing is assigned to them. They didn't choose it; it's part of their role. And so there's an interesting dynamic that um, there's a blank slate, so to speak, in terms of our bias or expectation. Um, and so to know someone is to get to know them in a very real sense. And there, those those facades are are dis, are brought down. So I, I think that's what part of what you're saying, and that that difference between reality and expectation, right? Does that make sense? Oh yes, yeah, yeah. and um, you know the. Uh, one interesting thing, I think in both situations, you know, the, the, the good side of people are, are usually what shines first. Mm. And uh, it's on the trail. If, if, I mean, I've done it and people have, have said it to me and, and I see it all the time is if, if somebody's sitting down, if they look hurt, if they look tired, if they look like they're struggling or out of water, people yeah. just stop. Some, you know, hey, can I help you? There's something I can get. I, I ran into a guy who was, um, uh, hiking for um raise money for polio awareness his name was owen and you know he's still raising money for it and i met him at 5 30 in the morning i was getting up early and i was my tent was very close maybe 10 feet away from the trail and he came he threw and he'd been hiking all night long and he was trying to make like 25 miles a day because he wanted to be he, he was gonna raise a hundred thousand dollars in 100 days and be in mount katana in 100 days mm. And we, we visited and, you know, I, I learned about his, his, what he's doing. Anyway, fast forward later that day after climbing Mount, I think Albert, Albert or Albert, but Mount Albert was 
Well, that was a hard mountain. Nope. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of just like scrambling up rocks. It, it, was, yeah. it was a cool mountain, but it was it was difficult. Anyway, this was like not, 10 miles after I saw him that morning. It was you know mm. several hours later, and there's Owen sitting on the side. Hey, hey what's going on? You okay? Yeah, well, I, I don't know. I, I think I've I think I've hurt my knee. Do you think it may be, you know, my meniscus or, or you know, potassium? I said, I don't know. So, but he said, but I'm good on uphill. So he just continued on ahead and went up the, he climbed, kept going up this mountain. And then at the top, he just started down and there he was again, sitting on the side. And I sat down and started talking to him. And he has, he has been on the phone with, a, I think, a brother or brother-in-law who they thought he had torn the meniscus in his knee. Mm. So... He was clearly going through the emotional struggle of, of he was out there. He was doing this for the um, Lions Club, I think, in, in yeah. Pennsylvania. And it was a lot of people were helping him. I mean, it was, it was out there. It was very visible. I'm going to do this. And if he tore the meniscus in his knee, then he wasn't going to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. So he was he was in that kind of mental mode of, you know, I've let all these people down. Yeah. So I started talking yeah. to him and. I said, can I help you carry anything? So I, I, he ended up giving me his, his bear canister and his water. And then we started down the trail and I followed him for about five miles and got to a place where he had arranged for a ride to pick him up. Yeah. I've yeah. been staying in contact with him. And um, turns out it was a, it was just a strained knee. So he mm -hmm. was able to rest it and get back on the trail, but mm -hmm. just slowed down instead of trying to, it was just an overuse injury in this case. But surprisingly, after I think 600 miles or some 650, he got off the trail. He just said, "I'm a, I'm a social animal. I need I need interaction and people." Mm, and the yeah. trail is, is you can make it. I think almost what you want, but you know, the majority of the time hiking, I'm by myself, which I love. Just being yeah, out there mm. and I'm by myself. So, um, so I guess you know each person is a, a little bit different in terms of. Yeah. Issues may be. So let's um let's clarify here. So you've you've started the trail. Um tell us how far along you are, where you stopped, um, and just give us a picture of, of what you've done so far and how long you've been out there. Sure. I've uh, started on March third, but I uh, <clears throat> for a couple different reasons. I had, a, I had I did have an injury, uh, shin splints that took me off the trail. I promised I'd come back and get my second COVID yeah. shot. That took me off the trail for a while. Um so I've, I've had about 25 days off the trail. But yeah. I, I started on March 3rd. I uh, am in Marion, Virginia, which is at, at mile 534.3, to be precise, yeah. uh, along the trail. And okay. so I, I left there on March, uh, May 10, 9, 8, 7th or 8th uh, or 9th or somewhere last week. And um, when I go back to the trail, I'm... I'm undecided yet um, if i don't go back until the latter part of june that probably doesn't give me enough time to start where i left off and get to, to mount katahdin by october 15th when the, the park closes so oh it actually you know, why does it close because of winter and snow it's just too um, cold and dangerous yeah too dangerous uh the snow and, and, it, it, and it can close earlier i don't know if it can close it closes later or not or it's just a fixed date i'm, I'm actually not sure but October 15th is the, the date you're told you need to be there by. Okay. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm thinking I may go up to Harper's Ferry and then hike from there. I may go up to Maine and hike back south. Okay. Or I think uh, just talking to a kind of a mentor who's, who's hiked the trail and, and I was talking to him today. And I think just because I do have an opportunity to maximize weather to my benefit. So, mm -hmm. you know, the heat of the summer coming up and the black flies up in, in Maine that, that are, are, are total nuisance, you know, for the first yeah. month or so. I think I may start in New England, like uh, the northern part of Connecticut and hike from there, get to Katahdin and then come back down to that same point in Connecticut and then hike south back down to where I complete the trail. So mm -hmm. it's a little anticlimactic to finish in Marion, Virginia versus you know, <laughs> Mount Katahdin with the iconic picture. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. you know, it's still, I'm, I no matter where I am, wherever I finish it, it's going to be, you know, kind of a tearful moment of, of, yeah. of both excitement and sadness. Yeah. So t tell us about the timing of it. So 
Um, you started this, um, you know, like you said in March, um, it's the middle of a pandemic. Um, did that have anything to do with it? Or was that just a coincidence that the world uh, crumbing, crumbing, crumbling down was, <laughs> was happening around you when you well, left? <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, I was actually afraid of, you know, the vaccine wouldn't come along and, and maybe it would delay things. Um, I actually had trouble. I mean, when I was getting the vaccine in February, in March, you know, it was, it was still hard to find a, a place I could, you know, get an appointment. Yeah. Now, I mean, just two months later, I'm driving through um, rural North Carolina and I see coming to this little town of four or 500 people and this flashing yeah. sign, you know, vaccine available, stop at city hall, anyone welcome. Okay. Like, wow. <laughs> it, 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 it went along, but most people start um, between March 1st and April 15th. And the, okay. most people, about 90% of the people yeah. start in Georgia. So it's like a tax time. evasion type of a mission. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's trying to, to, to fall between uh, weather. Okay. Not uh, okay, starting yeah. in deep winter, yeah. but also starting in time where you can finish, you can get to Katahdin before middle mm. of October. So there's just, there is a window that you, you know, it, it's got a lot of slack in it. Right. Which I've already used up a bunch of it. Uh, and I'll yeah. use it all up with this, you know, probably three or four weeks off the trail. Uh, home yeah. Right now. So, um, you know, this year, you know, starting in March, uh, was pretty darn cold. Uh, yeah. And a lot of people left the trail right away because they didn't do their homework and they weren't prepared <laughs> for the cold weather. And I mean, easily you, you knew it was going to get below the twenties yeah. up in these mountains with the wind blowing in which it, it did many, many, many nights. So yeah. it, it, can, it goes back to that, you know, just preparing, but that's why people start, tend to start there. So a crisis bubble is one of the downsides. Okay. So the, the, the shelters and the campsites get crowded. The trail gets overused. It's not great for the trail with, you know, 3000 people coming through it over a 15 day period. I mean, a 45 yeah. day period there. Unfortunately, it's, you know, I live by leave no trace behind principles. When I hike, everything yeah. on me stays on me. Yeah. And, and I try, I pack out all trash. I, I've picked up a lot of litter on the trail that I saw as I went. Yeah. But a lot of people don't do that, unfortunately. And mm. it does end up with that volume of people. Because some people started to think it's going to be a big party. Oh, okay. They try to make it that way, especially nights in the shelters. And usually by the time people get through the, you know, to the Smoky Mountains or, or, or through the Smoky Mountains, um, it's turned to a more, serious you know yeah all right if i'm going to do this then i need to focus so it's almost nice because you, the the fall off is almost nice because you you the people that aren't there for the i don't know what what if rights the, the right reasons or the genuine reasons or the authentic reasons um they fall off so that it's the people that that are more um prudent with their approach yeah and i'm gonna say it's probably some combination of that yeah. But there's just a there's a high volume of people that that start in that that time frame, so yeah. it, it tends to clog the trail up a little bit, and it makes you know sleeping in I don't I like sleeping in in shelters themselves. Yeah, I prefer much prefer to sleep in a tent. One, it's warmer than the, yeah. the shelter, and and two, there the norovirus is it was really starting to uh, catch up to where I was. Uh, okay, on the trail when I got off the trail, it's a uh, it's easily passed within in the shelters and that's where usually it typically uh, happens. And it's just, it's a, it's something that people have to be aware of when they hike the trail or is that a, a only, only when you hiked it, that it was. No, common? no, no. It's, it's a very common on the trail. It okay. really comes from people from poor hygiene. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Who aren't say, washing their hands have to go into the bathroom and they get some, the, and they, they share a bottle of water or some food mm -hmm. that they have and they just pass it on to somebody else. So, um, for that reason, I, I prefer to stay, you know, in tents as, uh, as much yes. as I can. In, in the Smokies, I, I stayed in the shelter a few times just because of the, the, the weather was incredibly bad. So mm -hmm. it was easier, but literally it was shoulder to shoulder to shoulder, not a just comfortable way to sleep. Yeah. Yeah. That's intense. Was so, it for me? So let's, let's kind of zoom out here. You know, you've been on, you said that uh, you've, you've been on the trail 40, 40 nights. Oh, and I, I, I should have added up the exact number of nights, but uh, let's see from from March third mm -hmm. to May third, and then add ten more to May thirteenth. So sixty, seventy, say uh, seventy, 
So maybe a little bit more, maybe okay. um, 70, 80 maybe nights. Around, yeah, maybe not. I've been mid 40s, 45 to 50 nights. Oh, okay. Probably 45 okay. nights on the trail. So, so what are the main, like, what are some of the big lessons you've learned so far from this experience? Um, I guess, you know, the, the main lessons you learn are, you know, all have to do with survival, I guess, because it's, um, it's having the right gear. It's taking care of your gear. It's yeah. having enough food. Um, and it's, it's, it's planning to a degree because, you know, on the, one of the nice things of the Appalachian Trail is that usually there's only one place on the trail where there's not going to be a resupply for food available to you within a, a three or four day window. Yeah. Uh, and that's in, that's up in the hundred mile wilderness in Maine. So, and even that there's ways to arrange for resupply. Yeah. For, so it's a certain amount of, of planning. And so you, I've, I've talked to guys who ran short of food. Well, other hikers will offer them something because, you know, yeah. there's always somebody who's got more or something. But when you add more food, you add more weight. So, mm -hmm. you know, since you're carrying everything that you own on your back, it's, you know, trying to maintain a weight within a certain range. To, yeah. so, so it's just there's a balance between what you have and what you eat and what mm -hmm. you carry and, and uh, uh, with the pack. Yeah. So, well, with that survival, um, you know, you have to, there's a, there's a, um, you have to bring it, you have to know what to bring, you have to know what to expect, you have to be prepared for it. And I, I mean, it sounds like a lot of people are, they're not even getting that basic, that basic level done when they're going on the trail. Um, so what, what, how, what was it that drove you to, to, that, that drove you to, to take all of these things seriously and to approach it that way. I mean, part of it sounds like you're there to finish. So you're, you're not there to mess around. And so you're going to lean into the, the facts and what's, what's expected and what, how that things play out. Is that what I'm hearing from you? Yeah. I mean, I, and I mean, the majority of the people do that, you know? Yeah. So I don't want to misrepresent that. The okay. majority of the people do, um, so it's interesting when someone doesn't, you know, mm. so it gets, it gets highlighted because of it's the anomaly the planning, of but, you know, so many people have hiked the trail that it's, um, and I don't know the numbers now. I think I said about 30, about 3000 start this year was more because there's, I've met many, many people who started last year and it got knocked off the trail mm. somewhere near the smoky mountains. Yeah. And, so they're but coming you said back. 3000, you said about 3000 a year. About three thousand, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's this, a small number. It's not a lot of yeah, people. Yeah, I know, but it's it's this can be higher number this year in terms of yeah. the, the trail. I think they was expecting four thousand. I don't know what the mm -hmm. final number is, or because because of uh, anyway because of hikers continuing off from last year. Oh, uh, okay. But and of those of those three or four thousand, you know, I, I read different numbers, but you know, you may get between twenty. And maybe 25, I don't think it's as high as 25, 15 to 20% who actually complete the trail. Yeah. So it's, you know, there's a, a lot of people are lost along the way. I mean, it could be finances because it's expensive to hike the trail. Yeah. Um, it can be an injury, of course. Mm -hmm. It can be, you know, a, a family situation that, that pulls you off the trail. I mean, there's a lot of reasons. Yeah. That, uh, other than I just, I give up. I'm just not interested yeah. in this anymore. Well, well, that and the idea of survival is interesting. I guess in in a sense that you have nature is rough, right? But at the same time, nature is beautiful, and and it and it energized you. So, how do you reconcile those two dynamics of you know nature trying to kill you and nature rejuvenating <laughs> you at the same time? <laughs> well, I, I I look at nature as a, a, a gift from God, and um, I really, really, really try to immerse myself into it as, as yeah. much as I can uh, and respect it as much as I can. And by respecting it, that means understanding as much as you can. And when you know there's a thunderstorm coming or when you know the weather is going to drop down in the teens tonight with 30 mile an hour winds, then you should, you know, probably pay attention to that, Yeah. And, you know, and, and be prepared as much as you can. But I, I tell you what, Jason, I just, you know, it is so awesome being on the trail and just watching in the springtime nature 
Mm. march forward i mean when i started the trail there was no leaves on the trees and now when i came down into damascus virginia the last five miles or so are just generally downhill and it was about i think a two thousand foot drop overall from elevation you yeah. literally could see the difference from the trees at, at i think when i started i was about mm -hmm. four thousand feet and the trees at 2,000 feet, the leaves were bigger. They're, all of a sudden, the trail went to this green hue. I mean, it was just it was beautiful. It was just, yeah, everything had was blooming down below when up high it wasn't. There were no songbirds on the trail until recently. Yeah, I guess I don't know. It was just the, the, so you could see all the stages of life. Oh um, yeah, it's awesome. From, and then from one X, my second to last day on the trail, I, I heard a, a, a rustling uh, in the leaves next to me. And it was a, a snake, a garter snake, a, a yeah. about two foot long garter snake that had just, and I, and I hope I'm not the one responsible, but it was it had just attacked a, a an eastern slimy salamander. Yeah, it was black and, and shiny, and uh, the, when I when I mean it literally it happened right when I stepped right as my my foot came down a few inches from the tail of the snake, so I got my my phone out and my camera and I started filming, and talk about nature, this it was this. It wasn't even a battle. It was just the you know, <laughs> the snake had wrapped itself around the salamander, and he was going to have his way. And I, I filmed the whole thing of him coiling around it and rolling around on the grass, and then getting his mouth in with the, the mouth of the salamander, his head in first, and yeah. he swallowed the whole darn salamander. And <laughs> I just watched it. I mean, there was no screaming. You know, there was no noise. It was just nature. You know, yeah, the circle of life, if you will. And it was it was just incredible to be able to to witness that. Uh, yeah, felt bad for the salamander, but you know, yeah, <laughs> the snake has it's not going to be hungry for a week or so. Yeah. Um, so I just like the connection um, mm. and seeing nature change, and and, and I almost feel like I'm I'm, I'm being you know part. I, I love the sound of the wind going through the trees when I'm laying in my tent because you literally can hear it coming from a long ways off, and just you hear it approaching and coming, and boom, it's over yeah. you, and you hear it going away. It's just it's cool things when you just you lay there and you're really paying attention. Yeah, I mean the the owls when they they get in these conversations with one another, you know, at five in the morning is cool to hear. And woodpeckers, you can hear them, you know, you can hear when they're pecking away for an insect, and and, and also you can hear when they they change the the cadence and the almost like Morse code, and they're communicating with another woodpecker. And you'll hear one reply from another tree, and then you'll hear it get closer. And it's just it's just fun to pay attention to all that and and to yeah. Uh, Healthy. So I guess, yeah. So as you're in creation and experiencing that, how does it, how did it affect your relationship with the creator? Um, I'm just, you know, thankful um, every day for uh, having the physical ability to be out there. I know a lot yeah. of people my age don't. Um, mm. And, you know, having the, um, the support behind me from, you know, family to, to do it and to be out there and, yeah. So, uh, even though I, I had to go out, well, my wife said, sure, you can have the trail, but, you know, you're going to have to find a way to pay for it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> you know, to be able to go out and and, and, and earn the, the money to do that and, and had a sister who was very generous and helped me and uh, Speed Pro and, and uh, helped support me on, on my yeah. track and John Barber. So, uh, you know, people have been very awesome in, in helping to make that happen. But I just... Every morning, I'm thankful when I lay there in my tent, yeah, uh, for God and, and for allowing me to be there and to. Um, my mind is open. I mean, on the the night that it was the, the coldest, it was it was just a miserable day. We came off of Max a place called Max Patch, beautiful place yeah. to go. And actually, you can drive up to the very top. There's a parking lot. It was just this awesome bald mountain with these incredible views. But the it was 40 mile an hour winds. It was super cold. The trail was muddy from the, the day before. It rained all day. I even slipped in the trail and fell and just got mud all over the side mm -hmm. of my clothes from the shoes up to my shoulder. And um, we finally got to the shelter and um, it was just, it was just miserable. And so <laughs> literally, I mean, usually, you know, this is after daylight saving. So we, we were literally in our sleeping bags and quills in the shelter by 6 p.m. Yeah. I mean, there's still two and a half hour, more hours of daylight. But yeah. it was so cold and there's nothing to do. I mean, if you were not playing catch or something. But so yeah. Everybody just tried to bundle up as best they could. And I laid there and I said, okay, God, 
I know tomorrow morning I'm going to wake up. So this is, uh, this is an experience. I look forward to this experience, you know, mm-hmm. and thank you for this. Um, so even if I didn't sleep, I knew I was going to be fine in the morning. I just might be cold, but yeah. it was, it's just another, you know, I look at everything on the trail, good or bad as an experience. And, mm-hmm. uh, I was thanking God for, you know, thank you for this, for this experience. Yeah. And actually yeah. I ended up sleeping you know, once it took me two, three hours to fall asleep, but once I did, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I stayed warm anyway. Yeah. So you mentioned, um, you know, f- having your phone and filming the snake and, and that's on your YouTube channel. And I'll put a link to the to the channel and the, the post here. But what's the relationship between hiking the trail and technology? I mean, that's that's obviously a newer thing in the last few decades, I would imagine. Um, whereas people, you know, that hiked it years, decades right. ago didn't have that. So what is the relationship w- between technology and hiking the trail for you? And what was it for other people? And uh, give us a little bit of an insight into that. Yeah, I'd say that's the uh, probably the major link, you know, back to this other universe. Yeah. You know, when, I'm, when I'm on the trail. And uh, so I've got, uh, uh, you know, because of weight, I'm trying to keep it down. So I'm, I'm not a YouTuber, professional YouTuber. I'm not trying to, you know, put out these incredible videos that are edited and have music. Yeah. I just take raw videos and I put them together and, and post them. Whatever is there is there. Yeah. Um, I try to talk about the trail and, you know, the difficulties and the beauty of it. I yeah. try to talk about the mindset that it takes to do and things like mm-hmm. that. But it's, um, so anybody planning that are interested in hiking the trail, I think it's probably got some informative, informative moments, uh, mm-hmm. uh, to help do that. But the, uh, so I just carry my phone. I yeah. carry, I carry a watch, uh, that I, I use for, um, uh, for the GPS for tracking my, mainly that's for my sons who, I post and once I can connect, you know, it's, it's whenever I get to a town and get Wi-Fi you know, that's strong enough, then I synchronize my watch and it synchronizes with an app called Strava. And now all of a sudden, you know, my mm-hmm. sons get all this detail on my height, the number of steps, the elevation gain, hours, yeah. and, uh, a map, you know, et cetera. And I just carry a, uh, so I carry those two devices and I carry a, a recharge 10,000 milliamp um, recharge device. It'll get me, you know, it'll, it'll get me, it got me through the Smoky Mountains, which took five and a half days. Uh, I made it. So it was just balancing because I don't have, I'm not on the phone a lot. I'm just using it for video. Yeah. I can't upload videos. I can't, I can send text Mm -hmm. is the most common thing I can do. And half the time that won't go through. Yeah. I can't make a lot of phone calls. So Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, so I leave my phone in airplane mode most of the time or turn it off at night. Just to try to save, save power. So that's really it. I have my phone. Uh, my watch and a recharge. Yeah. And I mean, I do have, the, do the shelters have, have recharging no. outlets? No. no. Yeah. Someone asked one time uh, at the beginning of the trail, they showed up and said, okay, you know, no, where do I get my water? What, you know, you, you put your shoes on, you walk down to this Creek or the spring and you <laughs> fill your bottle and then you come back and you filter it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and sometimes the water may be, you know, three tenths of a mile from the shelter down a mm. steep hill. Yeah. So you, you sometimes you really got to work for it. What type of filter did you use? Well, I started with uh, one a Sawyer filter, and uh, I actually changed after uh, I was I was stopped at a stream, and there was another couple there, and we're getting water, and I, I was yeah. squeezing the water out of my Sawyer, and he was three squeezing water out of one called Be Free. Okay, it was coming out like three times faster. I said yeah. I have to have one of those. <laughs> <laughs> this is taking forever. Uh, now, to be fair to Sawyer, uh, it could have been it was an older filter, it hadn't been used very much. Yeah, but I filters aren't super expensive. Like I've already replaced it once because I wasn't sure yeah. if I had left it out. And I think I left it out when the temperature was about thirty-two for a couple hours, and I didn't want to. It's, it's a cheap insurance to buy another one for twenty bucks, yeah. and then to risk, you know, getting some uh, bacteria in me from yeah. a, a um, yeah. So I guess back to the technology then. Um, what, what about other people? Like, how did they use it? Did it ever become distracting to the, like at a shelter or anything where it's like people are, are stuck on their phone versus interacting with each other? Or was, no. was there a respectful use of technology on the trail? Yeah. I mean, I'd say the most common use people use are phones for uh, like Kindle to uh, read books mm. or uh, to play music. Okay. A lot of people hike with music playing or listening to books. Oh, okay. um, yeah. I, I have avoided that for the most part. I've, Maybe in my last three or four days, I'd listen to music for a couple of hours. Yeah. Um, now I know coming out of uh, 
boots off hostel around this awesome lake in, in Tennessee. And I'm trying to remember the name of the lake. I was playing this old album of Peter, Paul and Mary from 1963. It was more <laughs> of a gospel album. It was before that. Okay. It was this awesome with these views and this lake and this, it, it was, it was great. But yeah. I really haven't used it very much for that. Um, though I probably will more. I mm-hmm. mean, uh, that's where the, probably the most common use. And I say there are, I've come across two or three, I call professional, um, uh, YouTubers and, you know, they, they have some really nice cameras and setups and, um, they, crews, you know, they have crew with them. <laughs> no, they don't have a crew. <laughs> it's just, um, <laughs> um, you know, maybe they have someone help edit it all and, and yeah. put music to it and post it for them. Uh, once they get the raw footage, uh, out yeah. so there's some people who carry some really nice camera gear. Yeah. Uh, for the most part, I see very little, very little. Okay. And you don't hear people playing music as they're walking down. I mean, if they do, they have on headphones. Okay. Stuff. They're headphones. Yeah. Quite, yeah. There's, it would be, that would be over the top. Uh, <laughs> Boom box on the shoulder. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be. Now, now you had talked about, you know, being prepared, taking the trail seriously, you know, having the things you need. There's also the aspect of that planning that, you you can't be too s- structured you can't you have to have flexibility um so what's the the flip side of that flexibility and being able to adapt uh, what did you learn on that front i haven't had a whole lot of situations i i, I had a near miss um i was uh, the night before getting into damascus which to me was a like this mental accomplishment that to yeah. me, that's where the first section of the trail. It's 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 right at 500 miles, a little bit less than 500 miles. I, I just I break the section into four, the trail into four sections. That section one for me ended at Damascus. Yeah. So when I um, it was the night before I got, I was hiking down there and I I camped and I broke camp and I left and I always make sure to look around and make sure I don't forget something. It it took me a month to remember to do that, <laughs> and I had. I leave my trekking pole sometimes, but I don't get mm-hmm. very far before I realize that I forgot my trekking pole. So that's not a big deal. And so I got all the way down in Damascus to the Damascus diner. I was dying to have a hamburger. Yeah. And, um, and the, the guy I was hiking with, um, he had stayed at this, when you first entered town, this park, he was taking a lot of pictures and he, and then another guy, the uh, trail name of Tinny. Yeah. Um, who, you know, super nice guy super long hair looks kind of like willie nelson he's got you know piercings and, and tattoos is this the nicest he he's he comes into town he's been looking for me i left my tent stakes um right there at the campsite somehow yeah. well i wouldn't have known that until i was 14 miles out of town mm. you know whenever i left damascus and that would have been how do you improvise i guess find mm. stakes but i haven't had other than finding um even level yeah. uh, campsites Sometimes okay. I have to improvise with how I lay out my tent and you know, yeah. how I'm able to strap it down. Yeah. Uh, to what about try letting to go it? of, you know, this sort of agenda of I've got to do a certain number of miles, I got to get to a certain point, um, being flexible to just go with what you're able to do, or, you know, how does that play in? Yeah, that actually is um, it's a great question because it that's what took me the, the, the took me the longest so far. Because I, I, I started because I was starting in, in quote the bubble of, of people. Yeah. Like the second my second night, the shelter was full. I mean, not when I say the shelter, I'm talking about the, the shelter itself and all the campsites around it. So if, if you came up there and if you had to go, you, you know, go find somewhere else to camp. Which yeah. usually, and one thing I learned is for the first, for the mile before the shelter and the next mile after, there's almost always what they call stealth campsites. Mm-hmm. There's room for one or two tents. There's an old fire ring, you know, so you can see their their past yeah. utilized campsites, and that's true everywhere on the trail except for the Smoky Mountains. They don't allow stealth camping in the Smoky Mountains, mm. uh, so you have to find space at the at the shelter. Yeah. Um, so it's um, that was you know part of what drive drove you know where was I going to be tonight? So what time would I leave? So you know try to plan when I would get there, and you know, it, it would start to introduce anxiety. It's like, you know what? I'm just going to hike. I'm just <laughs> yeah. going to hike. And, you know, the, the worst case scenario possible is I get there and there's no room and I have to continue on yeah. uh, until, until I find something. Um, 
So I, I, I learned to kind of let go of that. I, sl I slow down. I was, mm. you know, I slow down in terms of how I operate. Okay, well, get up. I, you know, I, I wanted to avoid taking the time to fix breakfast when I back yeah. when I first started. Now I sit down and I, I, I use the water. I use the fuel. I have a nice I heat up and have, you know, instant, my breakfast of choice now is instant oatmeal with instant carnation breakfast and a packet of instant coffee. Yeah. All mixed together. It's mm. it's filling. It's warm and, and <laughs> it's, it's nutritional. So it kind of checks off the and it's light to carry. Um, yeah. In terms of you know having a breakfast uh, squared away. Um, so I I guess um, my planning from a planning perspective, I've I've gone transitioned from really trying to be very very aware to being this let's just hike and see how far you go today and then just enjoy the spend more time enjoying the experience and yeah. not worry about it so much. And so like, you know, you talk about these two universes, the, the natural and, and the, um, the, the human man-made universe civilization, yes. um, and this very different speeds, right. The speed of life, you got fast forward and then you got slow motion, right? <laughs> yeah, really. So how, how do you dance between those two? I mean, since you, you had some breaks, um, um, and you were back and forth, you know, how did that play out? Did, did you have a hard time adapting between the two uh, speeds? No, I, I, I didn't, but I, I tend to, uh, on days that I knew I was going to uh, come into a town and either resupply or stay at a hostel or even take the next day off. And, and it's very common to take it what they call a zero day and just uh, rest the body, you know, yeah. if knees are hurting or feet are hurting, whatever it may be. So what, what, what led to you getting the shin splints at the beginning, you know? Um, yeah, the, okay. I started off with a pair of shoes that were minimal shoes or zero drop and they had minimal cushioning. Yeah. Uh, I love the shoes, very comfortable, but they're just, my feet were getting beat up with mm. the, um, uh, roots and the rocks and the, and the trail and just every step your foot comes down at a different angle. Yeah. You know, just these pounded and downhills are so hard. You know, there's just hard on the knees. Um, so I actually talked to my podiatrist and he suggested I, I get something, a, a stiffer boot, uh, or, um, a, a different shoe. Mm -hmm. So I, I tried going to a boot, um, which was felt great walking on rocks. I couldn't feel them, but it was, it was too drastic a change. And it, it actually made the shin splints worse. Uh -huh. I don't even know if it was shin splints cause it went away so fast. It could have been a tendonitis or just a strain. Yeah, uh, it would felt like pain from from shin splints. Um, so I went back to um, the the parachute. It, it originally started because I wore the shoes out. I, you know, they had no cushioning left, and that's mm -hmm. one of the major causes of shin splints. So I, anyway, I went back to the original shoes, um, and the shin splints. I mean, the, the, after six days of rest too, but the pain yeah. went away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, now I'm, I'm wearing the same model, same make of shoes, but just one with a, a lot more cushioning. Okay. You know, at the same time. Yeah. Interesting. So you just, you, you try to figure it out because the last yeah. thing you want is to be taken off the trail permanently because of it. Yeah. So it sounds like you, there's, there's an aspect of preparing, but, but also an aspect of the unknown that, that you have to, to adapt to based on your own personal circumstances within it. Sure. I mean, and you know, the trail <clears throat> provides, there's this a saying the trail provides. And when I came out of the Smokies, my last day had been raining, it was raining. And I, the trail was muddy and I was stepping to the side to avoid it. But it was on a slope. And my feet just went, slipped out from under me and I fell down straight on my shoulder on, on the mm. side of the trail. And I, I bruised something. Um, yeah. It still hurts me. I mean, today it still hurts. <laughs> and that was six weeks ago. Yeah. And when, I, when I got to the, the, I was going to a hostel at night. I, let, I finished the Smokies, which was an exciting moment. The, the Smokies are this mysterious, you know, that, they should film Stranger Things in the Smokies because it, oh, okay, it, yeah. it has that vibe about it, right? Yeah. And uh, so I was happy to get out. I loved it. I didn't say anything bad about the Smokies <laughs> when I was there, right? I respected the Smokies. But I was glad to finish the Smokies. <laughs> I, had, I had done it. They were beautiful. Um, but I went to a hostel called um, uh, Standing Bear Farm. Yeah. And uh, I went to this guy, Community Kitchen. It's kind of like an old hippie commune type feel to this place. And I said, hey, anybody here a doctor? And uh, a guy goes, no, but uh, I'm a, a occupational therapist, and his trail name is Aqu Aquaman, and okay. he is a professional YouTuber, and he does an awesome job. 
Yeah. So check out Aquaman. He he is awesome. So he came over and did a little, uh, you know, gave me an examination and okay, I don't think anything's torn. I think you bruised it and here, do these three exercises. Yeah. I said, all right, well, I can I buy you a beer. Well, I don't drink, but you, you know, how about a Mountain Dew? So I paid <laughs> for the Mountain Dew was <laughs> the cost of my office visit there. Yeah. So it's pretty cool how uh, the, the trail will provide and you know, just kind of puts you in proximity. And then when my shin splint started, I happened upon Aquaman again a second time. Oh, okay, wow. It's called Roan Mountain, Roan Highlands. Also a beautiful part of the trail, the Roan Highlands, if you just want to hike sections. Yeah. You know, hike, go to check out the Roan Highlands. Um, and, you know, he, he gave me a couple things to do and suggestions for the for the shin splint. So anyway, the, the trail will provide for you. Yeah. So what is, so dive into that a little bit more in terms of like the people and the community and who you meet. Now, I remember before you left, you had made a comment to me about you wanted to go on the trail and meet people that had diametrically uh, opposed points of views politically or, or whatnot. And you right. wanted to just listen to them. So did you get a chance to do any of that type of thing uh, your, to challenge your own biases and experiences? And then, yeah. and then how did that play out? I have. Um, I will say that, 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 that that's another one of the really cool things about the trail. You know, you meet people, I, you know, I don't, you don't have a label on yourself that says, you know, liberal or conservative or Republican yeah. or Democrat or wherever the hell you may be. You're just people. Yeah. And, you know, and politics so far for me, the only, any time I got involved in, in even remote political discussion, it was after somebody I knew, you yeah. know, we already been hiking together for a couple of days. We'd already gotten to know each other to a, yeah. to a certain extent, not, not from a, uh, a political perspective, but just from a personal perspective. So there was respect that was built there. Um, so you, you know, never really had any, um, you know, never had a heated discussion, just, you know, I had some interesting discussions and, you know, I, I, and I was, was saying to myself at the time, okay, I'm, I, I truly want to learn and, and try to understand. So I'd ask a lot of questions that maybe sounded like I was challenging, but it's like, no, I'm just trying to understand because it's, yeah, this, this is helpful for me. Yeah. So I will continue that uh, on the trail because it's I just I just find it fascinating. Uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's not just politics. I mean, there's random conversations that, that lead to random subjects. There was a, a guy I was hiking with uh, Biscuit uh, coming into Damascus and super nice guy. But, you know, young guy and he just I didn't have him pegged for a, a fan of of. Um, classical music yeah and we started yeah. talking and he said oh yeah i've been i've been listening to every version every recording of beethoven's nice symphony so i can figure out which one's the best yeah wow you know, that's, <laughs> that's awesome which one's the best <laughs> the berlin philharmonic right now that's the that's the top one he sent me a link to it so i could listen to it yeah so it was just you know it's cool stuff like that it, it, it doesn't have to be politics it's just things that maybe you don't expect or just kind of pop up in the course of a conversation yeah so what else would be interesting about the people or the community of, on the trail that's unique um, to the trail? Well, I guess that's unique to the trail. I mean, the typical conversation goes, you know, do you, what's your trail name when you meet somebody? Where are you from? Just you know, maybe there's yeah a, a link there that, you know, that you would you know, start. Yeah. Are people down. interested in, you know, what's your, what, what do you do to make money? What's your job? Or, yeah, you know, a, lot, a lot of times, you know, are, you know, are you retired? What do you know? You know, a lot of young people I've talked about were were there. I mean, the, someone I met on the last day on, on the trail before I came home was she was hiking specifically to, to answer that question. What's you know yeah. what, what is she going to do? This was a her whole point of hiking the trail was to make some career decisions. Mm. Um, where she's so time to think about them. The time to think about them, and I, and I and my advice to her because she was really trying to answer the question, what am I going to do? I yeah. said, don't try to answer that question. Just because you'll never get there just relax open your mind up and live in the present moment just be aware of what's coming at you and you know you will see opportunities you know the universe will put those doors out there but if, if you're just focused on one thing you you'll pass them by and you won't see them so just you know keep an open mind and hike the trail like that and just take everything in and mm -hmm. the opportunity will be there you just have to be able to spot it when it yeah. happens mm. So, but, you know, I guess, you know, I, I talking to people, it's, it's, um, 
I like I like hiking by myself, but at the same time, I like hiking with because you're you're hiking for eight, ten hours, you know, sometimes a lot longer. Um, so I don't I don't mean all eight or ten hours by myself, but yeah, um, you know, probably the, maybe six of those hours, five of those hours yeah. are I even mean, if you, even if you have a hiking partner or or a, what they call a tramily, your your trail family. Oh, okay, yeah, um, you would uh, typically. You get together, you know, at, at you know, you, you determine, you know, where we're going to end up tonight, and yeah. then they go there and they go on their own pace, and they're, you know, they might okay. hook up, at, you know, bumping each other at lunchtime or something. And they, mm. Some people like to stop and take breaks. Some people like to keep going. Some people are faster. Some people are slower. And yeah. it's you know, it, it it's it's, just, it's very respectful of hike your own hike, which is yeah, you know, it's a real thing. It's, it's you know, the, probably the, the, the number one saying on the trail. Because it's very easy to get wrapped up into, well, I'm going to slow down because I'm waiting for so and so, or I'm, uh, you know, I like hiking with this person, but you know they're not going the pace I like. So hike your own hike. Yeah. Right? Just hike your the trail the way you want to hike it, and the rest will just kind of happen organically and, and happen naturally. Yeah. So you've kind of used a bunch of phrases. It, it sounds like there's an entire trail language. So there is. There that. is. Yeah. There is a. A trail lingo that even you know sometimes I hear things I don't I hadn't heard before. <laughs> For the most part, they're pretty straightforward. You know, I I I, I couldn't go through them all. I would just off the top of my head. Zero I mentioned. A Nero is when you uh, maybe have four or five miles to get into a town. You plan it that way because you don't okay. want to spend the money to stay overnight. Mm -hmm. So you'll you'll get there early enough in the day because most hostels will let you take a shower and do laundry for you know five dollars if you're not if you're not staying there yeah so you get time time to get in town do laundry um get a shower you get a food resupply and then leave town you know late afternoon and hike another you know two or three miles onto the trail to find a place to camp yeah so it's good it's a good way to kind of keep your expenses down but stay stay a little bit fresh you know yeah. while you're on the trail i think you know probably because of my age i i find it um uh, I need to stop and, you know, you know, at a hostel or a hotel, you know, I don't know what the, the yet, but I'm saying probably once a week. Yeah. I need yeah. to do that. And then, you know, that means I still need to resupply in between and get it cleaned up. Yeah. But, um, you know, just sometimes I need and, and take a zero, maybe every 10 days where yeah. I'm just taking yeah. a day off the trail. But are you taking, like, are you, are you doing stuff that's right off the trail in terms of staying at places or eating or, or are you like, getting an uber and go into some part of the city yeah there's a surprising <clears throat> large number of hostels that are literally right on the trail or maybe within half a mile of the trail or a mile and and the ones that are further if they're with like a few miles away they will come and get you and pick mm -hmm. you up and bring you back and most hostels that uh maybe not most many of them are too far outside town so they will run a shuttle to take you into town so you can resupply, maybe eat at a restaurant and, yeah. then, and then bring you back. Uh, a lot of people will hitchhike. I haven't uh, had to do that yet. I don't, I don't mind because people yeah. are used to picking up hikers because mm. there's, there's a lot of road crossings where the, where the, where the, yeah. the trail will cross either, not just major highways. And we've, I've walked underneath a couple different interstates, but, uh, uh, you know, state roads, yeah. uh, four service roads, that are commonly used um so you can when you cross those you can find rides yeah um, so that and all times you'll find uh another probably the favorite term everybody has on the trail is, is trail magic okay where literally someone you you just you come down out of this hill and boom all of a sudden there's a road and uh, and you see a car with a little table set up and you know all right, this is probably trail magic. And I mean, people <laughs> set up and they're fixing hamburgers or cheeseburgers or breakfast burritos or uh, scrambled eggs, uh, hot dogs, and they have sodas. Sometimes they'll have beer, uh, chips. Are they selling it or is it? A oh, donation? no, it's, 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 it's free. It's just they're giving back to the trail. Almost all of them I met were former through hikers mm. who appreciated what others did for them. And I intended to do it as well. Yeah. Uh, is just set up for a few hours one day or, yeah, you know, for morning or for, for breakfast or for lunch and just, you know, water, um, you know, dump your trash. If, if you have trash, um, and one of them, the woman said, Hey, I can, another term is slack pack. 
Yeah. And she said, Hey, um, this is on the, the day before I got to Damascus. She said, I can, I'm going to this road that crosses the trail in, in 10 miles of trail miles. If you want, I can take your pack. And I can give you a small pack to wear. Mm. So I said, heck yeah. A lot of people don't, aren't, some people I think, don't want a slack pack. They want to carry their full pack all the way to the Katahdin. Mm. I've slack packed twice and I'll, I'll be happy to yeah. do it again. Because well, it, it sounds like you're um, a, a purist might question a lot of your decisions. Um, the pure, most purist would be the person, the unassisted person that goes from the beginning to end without any breaks. So is that a thing on the trail or yeah, do those I, people I, exist? I don't think so. I think, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm following the middle. Uh, yeah. there's some people will, will, what they call aqua blaze, okay. uh, where they can, there's one in, um, by boots off hostel. I forgot the name of the town where, um, you, can actually ride in a kayak down this oh, lake okay. for like wow. 10 miles, but you've covered 20 trail miles mm. when you get off. So I, I wouldn't be cool with that. Um, I think you should, and I try to hike the trail, you yeah. know, I don't want to get on a, a, what they call a blue blaze. The trail is full of white blazes. They're white rectangular blazes and that's the marking for the trail. Oh, okay. Blue blazes are always side trails. So mm. they're going to a shelter or to a water mm. source or maybe to a, 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 a view or a waterfall or you know something that might be interesting to see um i do take as many of the blue blazes as i can because i want to see as much as i can yeah like the trail so i don't mind taking the time uh, mm -hmm. to go do that but i'm, I'm kind of in between I'm, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a purist in terms of i want to hike all of the trail yeah uh, but i think it's okay to slack pack once in a while some people yellow blaze where they literally get a ride to a different part of the trail and just skip it you know yeah i'm not, I'm not good with that yeah <laughs> you, know, you, you know you're hiking the the trail so hiking yeah the trail, hiking, right? yeah um so i, I kind of fall in between but i think you yeah. should should hike the trail i think slack packing is probably viewed by the majority of the people as a, a very common uh, thing to yeah. do. i mean it just just can help you get to maine and, you know maybe uh maybe i'll uh, re advise it uh, revise it so it's, it's okay if you're over 50 to slack pack you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but what's it what's it like to to eat a restaurant meal after a long day of hiking. It is so awesome. Um, and just, you know, it, it takes a, takes a few days, but hiker hunger definitely sets in. I, I lost actually I started the trail at 181 pounds and I was down to 166. Yeah. When I, when I got home and I've been in towns gorging myself with, with, so you, you absolutely maintain a calorie deficit. I just don't have, I haven't figured out how to eat 5,000 calories a day mm. while on the trail yeah. and have, have the room and, and, and to carry it all. Yeah. I, I just, I'd be eating constantly. So, so you make you know, up look, for it at the restaurant. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I definitely, I mean, I big salads, I get a lot of vegetables and I get, you know, big greasy, juicy hamburgers. I mean, <laughs> on the trail every day, I add two packs of olive oil to every one of my dinners. I got these individual servings. Of what, olive what does oil. that do? Just get the additional calories and oils. Okay healthy oils yeah. into my body um, Interesting. I, yeah so i'm eating for breakfast and then I, I carry snacks and i snack all day long yeah I'm, you know about every hour i'm pulling out another snack and then i stop for lunch yeah which is usually a like tortilla. what are some of the snacks that you eat like beef jerky nuts what, what is yeah. it yeah beef jerky nuts uh, gummy bears they're actually yeah. high in calories um okay a lot of uh uh pro bars they're 400 calories per bar snickers yeah. is the number one food on the trail Oh, okay. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. Do they have There's stations some, along the way? <laughs> yeah, just, they probably should. A lot of people, unfortunately, will hike the trail just focused on calories. I mean, mm. that's it. No, these empty, no nutritional value of the food. Uh, oh, okay. I try to get the food. So I'll, I'll even though they're expensive, I'll, every four days I'll have in my pack at least one quality freeze dried meal for dinner yeah. um, that has a good balance. Uh, and uh, I mean, a lot of the energy bars and the, the bars that are out there now are, really do a good job of, of quality ingredients and a good balance between, you know, calories and carbohydrates and, and, and fats yeah. and protein. Mm -hmm. uh, so I get a lot of protein. But I still yeah. lost weight. And I just yeah. couldn't I couldn't get 5000 calories a day into my body. I'm, I'm thinking I'm about to double check on getting maybe thirty five hundred mm -hmm. you know, calories. And that's that's hard to do. So. I yeah. eat in the restaurants as, as often as it, whenever I'm near a town that, that has one. 
Yeah. So it's an issue, and it's it's something a lot of people, you know, have to pay a lot of attention to. And I, if I kept losing weight, I'd probably have to figure out how to resolve it. Yeah. How do I resolve <laughs> it? Yeah. Every, one day out of every seven days, you just need to sit and eat a lot of food in a, in a town. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I, I'll 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 figure it out. But I I don't. That's why I'm working now, so I can have plenty of money to. And yeah. Because I don't want to get into town and not be able to go get a, a nice uh, dinner yeah. or a hamburger or salad or something. So tell me about you know there there's the weather the t- different types of weather you experience, but within that, you know you're an ice bath kind of guy. You're a Wim Hofer. Um, how does that play into your experience? Um, how do others respond to it? Right. And, and did, how much does it prepare you for the actual weather that, that where you face those things in nature versus in a, a cooler in your, in your house? Okay. The, um, you know, interesting question because is I, I do think about that a lot. The, I think the number one thing that, that, you know, practicing the Wim Hof method and, 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 being comfortable in the cold does for me on the trail it i have no anxiety over yeah. okay today it's going to be raining or snowing or sleeting the wind's going to be blowing i just okay it's an, it's an experience you know it's not my favorite you know, <laughs> but i'll be okay um i may be miserable but you know when i get to the camp i'll get into clean dry clothes and when i get in my tent and i'll be okay um you know you know and functionally and how I've, I've used it when I'm on the trail, it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, people kind of laugh, Hey, come on. You're, you're the, you're the Wim Hof guy. Come on. <laughs> it's, it's just hiking your shirts, you know, your shorts. Um, the, what I have used it for, um, uh, is probably my hands get the coldest, even with gloves on, especially when it's raining is, you know, the gloves you buy that say waterproof, they're not, Yeah, <laughs> they may be water resistant for a while, but they're not waterproof for hiking all day long. So your hands get wet, they get cold and the fingers start getting numb. Yeah. Uh, so that was one of the exercises they had us do at training uh, when I was at Mount Hood for uh, becoming an instructor is they had us put our hands in a, in a river that was glacier melt water coming straight off of Mount Hood. This is yeah. at the base yeah. of the mountain. So it was cold and we left our hands in that water. I don't know. It was probably eight to 10 minutes. It was a long time. And, you know, wow. when you do that, you, you're, vasoconstriction your blood vessels will constrict in your your hands because it didn't know how long you're going to be in there and it's going to take that warm blood and protect the organs and the, the uh, cavity okay. in, in your yeah. in your chest even so, though they're fine that's, that's why yeah. your hands hurt so much when you you expose them to cold your your blood vessels are constricting and reducing the flow of blood uh so they okay you know now stand up now look at your hands now make them warm just using your mind and i could i was able to direct warm blood from my from my body to my hands to warm them up mm-hmm. um, so i do the same thing i'm on the trail i can be hiking and focusing on my hands they're cold they're numb and just you know help i'm not gonna say i make them warm i'm making so they're not numb anymore <clears throat> yeah uh, so i just make them so I, they're they're comfortable yeah inside yeah. the gloves and it works and so mm-hmm. i've used that i've used the because I've taken thousands of deep breaths over the last four years, so my lungs are are at capacity. When I when I when I take a deep breath, I'm filling my lungs every square centimeter. Yeah. Of my lungs. And then when I let it go, and when I take it in, it's I know I have a strong cardiovascular system. I'm, I mean, I'm getting blood to little capillaries I hadn't seen blood for a long time. Yeah. So I'm, I'm getting fuel to the engine you know, for climbing hills, especially. So I know I can go up a hill and I do, I mean, I, people hear me coming. Oh, they can, I mean, they're, they're going up Trey mountain in Georgia, there was this young guy <laughs> that I passed him four times going up the mountain. He had to stop and, you know, catch his breath. And I was just, I could just keep going. I just I put my uh, pole down and for two steps, taking a super deep breath and then for two steps, I'd let it out. Mm-hmm. Two steps, I'd take it in, two steps, I'd let it out. Just, it, I'm, I mean, entering the Smokies, you have an eight mile climb. Yeah. You're, you're, you're going because the Smokies are all around five to 6,000 feet and you're going from a lower elevation. So you got to get up there. So, yeah. Yeah. so I can go in these, we have a bunch of these three to five mile climbs that are, you know, tiring. I, yeah. just, I just keep going. I can fuel 
the engine using my, that's not the Wim Hof method per se, but it's, I've benefited from practicing the Wim Hof method and making my lungs so efficient and my circulatory system uh, strong. Yeah. So I talk to people, everybody, not everybody. I mean, if, it, if the opportunity presents itself to, to mention, or oh, are you familiar with Wim Hof? If they, you know, then if people are interested in talking about it, then I will start talking about it. And I've had people come up, you know, are, are you the breathing guy? Are you the guy that knows Wim Hof? You know, a couple, have you met Wim Hof? Yeah, sure. What? Wow, come here. Listen, this guy's Wim Hof. So, you know, the, the awareness of Wim Hof is from, you know, I, I don't know him to, wow, you actually met him. So, yeah. it, it, you know, it's, it's all over. But the awareness of the Wim Hof method is significantly higher for people on the trail than it is for back in this universe. Yeah. And that, that makes sense because, you know, if you're on the trail, then you are more open to nature. Yeah. And uh, being part of nature and, and probably more open to uh, methods that help mm -hmm. you and your body in, in, in natural ways. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess, you know, when, what was it like teaching people a bit of method on the trail then? Oh, it was, it was really awesome because um, there was, um, I mean, I've, 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 I don't know how many people I've actually trained on the trail, but I mean, it's not, it's still probably 20, 25 uh, yeah. people. And, you know, I'm, and that's part of my goal is, you know, all the way to Katahdin. If somebody's interested in the Wim Hof method, I will, I'm teaching them enough to, to begin the practice, but I encourage them when they get home to, you know, study it, to research it, to, you know, find ways to deepen their understanding and, and experience, but if they can to attend a class, cause that'll let them ask questions and it will expose yeah. them to the whole method, including the, uh, the cold water. Uh, but um, I've had some interesting experiences. One was, uh, it was four young guys. They were all in their young twenties, very energetic. And, and, and they hike, and of course I'm, I'm going, I, I hike every, I average two to two and a quarter miles per hour. And these guys are, three miles per hour easy yeah about i mean they just zoomed by me and uh and so the last guy was kind of slowed down he started talking and we started visiting and he was from australia and he'd been in the u.s for about six months and uh because there's there's a lot of wim hof instructors in australia so i said oh are, are you familiar with wim hof well i've heard the name but not well tell me about it so anyway okay well would you would you teach me would you tell me about it so i said well we can't practice while we're walking but i can i'll explain it to you and I did and talked about, you know, the breathing and the mindset and, and cold exposure and, you know, why we do it and how you do it, and the, the breathing portion. And, you know, we had a great conversation. And he, you know, you know, thank you, mate. And uh, he, he took off. And uh, I came upon these guys in about half a mile. We've been following this awesome, beautiful creek out of, out of Irwin. I just love this walking around, uh, <laughs> following the sound of a river. It's yeah. just a cool, I just, I love doing it that way. There's several places on the trail where it happens for, you know, a decent amount of distance each time. And there's this, this beautiful Creek, maybe 10 or 15 feet wide, wasn't huge. And I, I come upon the four guys and they've all stripped down to their underwear and they're getting ready to get into the Creek. It's cold. <laughs> the water was cold in it for sure. And they said, come on, you want to get in with us? And I said, okay, sure. So uh, <laughs> I got down to my underwear and I laid in the Creek and you know, they're in the Creek and, you know, they're shivering and, you know, a couple of guys were like, Oh, but, uh, you know, just relax, take a deep breath. And they, they all did fine, but it was, it was a fun experience. Yeah. So, I mean, you're used to getting in your, um, your cooler with ice, ice water every morning, uh, but did you have a Creek every day you could jump into? Uh, how, no, how did, no, that, that was most of the water sources are just, uh, trickles of water. Yeah, okay. Yeah. They're, they're, fortunately they're springs and they're, you know, people will put a pipe or even a, a, a leaf from a, a rhododendron <laughs> uh, bush because they're just wide. And if you position it right, it, fun it funnels the water and it just comes mm -hmm. off of it like a spigot. Um, so that usually you're not, you don't get a water source that you can, you can do that. But when I do, I typically will um, take my shoes off and sit there and put my feet in the water. Okay. Cause my feet get swollen hiking all day long. Yeah. And just, they get beat up on the trail. You know, I haven't had any foot issues. You know, I had the, yeah. the shin splints, but and no real issues with my feet. So I, I find those opportunities. Uh, the best one, highly recommend if people are just looking for a place to go hike for a couple of days, hike uh, the Laurel Canyon and Laurel Falls there mm -hmm. in Tennessee. It's just absolutely incredible. My favorite oh, part of the trail so far. Yeah. 
what are your final thoughts, words of wisdom, things you'd like to share before we close out here? Well, I, I say if you're considering the Appalachian Trail, you know, as we talked about, be sure to, you know, research it, but also do your own internal research of yourself and, and really understand um, what you hope to gain. All right. Yeah. And maybe you don't know, but, uh, you know, at least have a sense for it. It's, it's, um, it's very, very rewarding. It's incredibly yeah. rewarding, and both from a, a spiritual perspective, a physical perspective, a mental uh, perspective. And the lessons I've learned and a lot of things we've talked about all apply to life, uh, to home. I mean, I, I you know, my, just, you know, I, I miss my family a lot when I'm on the trail and a couple of times where I've been off, and I get back on. It's been an interesting, I, I literally, I, when I get out of the shuttle or however I got back to the trail, uh, I'll take a step. I'm starting, I got my pack on, I'm starting for the day. I take a step and I go, ah, I just, I'm happy. You know, as long as I get back on the trail and I feel that same way every time that I know, I, you know, I need to keep hiking. I did say in one of my videos that, um, I think there's only three reasons to to leave the trail an injury which obviously you need to come off if, if you need to come off you do but it's something you can come back from whether it's you know six weeks six months a year doesn't matter but you can always go back um a family matter like you know coming home from my daughter's birth and i, I plan to go back to the trail i mean i'm, I'm scheduled to go back to the trail but if, if something occurs that you know i need i'm needed here well that would have a priority over going back to the trail because i can always yeah. go back next year right and then I said, the third reason, if this happened to me, I wouldn't come back to the trails. If I, if I stopped being inspired by the trail every day, because yeah. literally I am. And, you know, I, after, you know, that was after about only maybe 20, 25 days in the trail. So I've been on it, but um, what I've learned is, and for talking to others, I think it's, it's hard. It's not going to inspire you every single day. You're, you're going to have bad days. You're just, yeah. so accept that you're going to have bad days, but if, if the trail does inspire you to do something, all right, to explore yourself, to explore the world and understand the world better. I mean, I have a significantly better connection with nature now. And, you know, I have a, a better, um, I'm not a, uh, I don't want to offend anybody. I'm not a, a quote tree hugger, right. From a, as an environmentalist, but yeah. I love nature. But yeah. I'm much more I'm acutely aware now of 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 uh, development and progress and you know and progress in some people's minds and you know I look at it a lot differently than I did uh, in the past and I don't know what change that's going to create in me other than a much greater respect for nature but you know maybe I'll advocate for something when I get back that that will I don't know I mean I think I'll always be learning from the trail years after I finished it. Uh, in ways that it may have impacted me yeah yeah that's awesome well thank you so much for sharing i appreciate it well thank you jason i i, I love it and it's, it's great to be back in this universe but uh i'm looking forward to um getting back on the trail at the same time awesome well we'll uh we'll touch base uh later to find out what what's going on okay well great well thanks a lot appreciate it <laughs>